screen share. That's it. We are recording now. Okay, now we are, we are ready, uh, ready to start. Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف خلق الله الأجمعين سبحانك اللهم سبحانك اللهم هديتنا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم It is my great pleasure today to introduce great prof our great prof John Doyle It is so great honor for me to have contact him and he welcome to share us our scientific activity. Thank you, Prof. Jean Doyle. Uh, it, was, it will be an amazing uh, scientific uh, presentation. Uh, we're waiting uh, so much from you, from your um, uh, fa fascinating lecture, and we are waiting uh, uh, a highly informative uh, lecture uh, based upon your uh, high experience in this special field and hot topic which is the secret and mastering of awake intubation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor John Doyle. He is uh, a very good friend since more than eight or nine years since he's working in uh, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Zab. And he was active in all anesthesia scientific activities and also in MIGA online course as well. Now he is most welcome to Monophilia Anesthesia being and the ICU club. And he's talk today about the secrets of mastering a weak intubation. Professor John Doyle, he is a retired professor of anesthesia. He was working in Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, in the United States. Also, he's a professor of anesthesiology in Cleveland Clinic, Lerner College of Medicine, Case Western Reserve University. And you are most welcome, Dr. John Doyle, and I am sure you will enjoy his lecture. Welcome, Doyle. Hey, thank you, Sapa, and thank you, Yasser. This was a, a great opportunity, and uh, I enjoy the invitation. I look forward to future invitations. Today's presentation deals with the secrets of mastering awake intubation. On the left, you can see a picture of me performing an awake intubation. Uh, this was probably around 10 or 15 years ago. And you can see the nurse there that was assisting me with the procedure. At the end of this presentation, the learner should be familiar with the following things. Number one, the key management decisions in difficult airway cases. Two, be familiar with the various difficult airway algorithms. Three, recognize situations where intubation is going to be difficult. Then I want to get into the art and science of awake intubation, the core of the presentation. And then finally discuss some specialized equipment for laryngoscopy and intubation. So this is what I'd like to cover mostly. And a good place to start is with the American Society of Anesthesiologists difficult airway algorithm. So in 1993, the American Society of Anesthesiologists formulated their first edition of the difficult airway algorithm. It has uh, a new uh, edition that came out 10 years later in 2003, another one in 2013, and another one this year in 2022. This uh, algorithm is available in detail. Uh, you don't have to go to a subscription barrier to get the full PDF. But here I want to give you a synopsis of the approach. And the question that you have to deal with right up front is, are you going to intubate after the induction of general anesthesia, or are you going to do awake intubation? So you have awake intubation on the left and intubation attempts after induction of general anesthesia on the right. So typically, if you know the patient is going to be difficult right up front, awake intubation is appropriate. And that may even require in some cases a failure invasive of, uh, uh, airway access such as might be a tracheostomy under local. But in most common cases, you will attempt intubation after the induction of general anesthesia with propofol and for example, uh, rocuronium. And if you have trouble, with, uh, have trouble with that at any point, number one, call for help, see about spontaneous ventilation and wake up the patient. Then the question is, are you able to do 
كويسه face mask ventilation بيحلوا الموضوع ده ايه ده فهم الاثنين دول مربوطين في بعض فبيحطها كده فهنا المشكله فيها ايه بقى okay um if someone is um able to do mask ventilation adequately you go down the non emergency pathway and that may involve things like for example uh alternative approaches <تصفيق> Uh, as an example, uh, if the ventilation is not adequate, you might want to try a robotic airway, such as the mask airway. So that's the essence of it. There's a lot more detail than that, but I want to give you an example of a patient who, right up front, you can tell that this patient is going to be difficult by ordinary Here are the 2003 practice guidelines for the airway. This shows the components of a preoperative airway physical exam, showing that there are a number of things that you have to take into account in predicting whether someone is a difficult intubation. For example, the degree to which they can open their mouth is very important, the inter incisor uh, distance. So these are all examples of problems that are very important. So there are 11 factors in all here, and no, it's hard. hard to know which ones are more important than others, but certainly the visibility of the uvula is always encouraging. Um, the length of the neck and the thickness of the neck are important factors as well. If you have too many non-reassuring findings, very often people will go to awake intubation or have available alternate techniques of intubation after the induction of anesthesia. <laughs> Unfortunately, it sounds like uh, someone has forgotten to turn off their microphone and we're getting some feedback from somebody. Uh, can everybody check to see that their uh, microphones are off, that they're muted? Now, here we have practice guidelines for managing the difficult airway just like before, but the question is, what about video laryngoscopy? Because the predictors of difficulty with video laryngoscopy are different and remain a matter of um, some scientific progress. So here uh, is the SA Difficult Airway Algorithm 2013. And as I said, there's been some modifications for 2022 in the fourth edition. But what I've said is that you can get this online free. Just uh, uh, Google it and you can find the website where you can download it in PDF format for your teaching. But that being said, uh, there are some recommendations that apply for all cases of a suspected difficult airway. Uh, number one, tell the patient about the special risks. Number two, make sure another individual is available to assist, and that'll typically be another anesthesiologist. And three, give supplemental oxygen by managing the airway, and typically that would be nasal prongs during fiber optic intubation. So here again is the difficult airway algorithm in more detail, and what I want to emphasize the first part is you have to assess what's going on. Assess the likelihood and clinical impact of basic management problems like difficulty with ventilation, difficulty with intubation, difficulty with patient cooperation or consent, uh, for example, intoxicated patients or patients in a coma, and difficulty with tracheostomy. Uh, and by that, they mean either tracheostomy, second and third um, tracheal rings, or a cricothyroidotomy through the cricothyroid membrane. The next thing you want to do is consider the relative merits and feasibility of three basic management choices. Are you going to do awake intubation or intubation attempts after the induction of general anesthesia? And more commonly, you'll attempt intubation after the induction of general anesthesia, unless it's obvious that awake intubation is needed. The second question is, are you going to take a traditional non-invasive approach for intubation with a tube uh, and a laryngoscope? or an invasive technique for initial approach to intubation, which would be rarely done, but for example, could be tracheostomy under local for a patient with massive tubers of the airway. And the third question is, do you wanna preserve spontaneous ventilation or are you going to ablate spontaneous ventilation with neuromuscular blocking drugs? And there are some situations, particularly with the anterior mediastinal mass, where preservation of spontaneous ventilation is considered to be the appropriate course. Then, as I said, we go into the awake intubation versus intubation attempts after general anesthesia. And a key point here, as I said, is that if you are unsuccessful intubation, you wanna check out 
whether the face mask is working. If the face mask is working okay, you can wake the patient up and you can consider other things like awake intubation. If you're having trouble with a face mask, you can try and rescue them with a supraglottic airway. If that's not working, you may need emergency invasive airway access. So there are three situations you must always have a plan for. Number one is awake intubation, and we're going to be going over that in this presentation. The second one is the patient is difficult to intubate, but easy to ventilate. And a lot of time there, you'll just want to wake up the patient and then come up with a second plan, which could be awake intubation, or in some cases, might be regional anesthesia. And then the patient who cannot be intubated or ventilated, this is a real emergency, and very often a surgical airway is required in such a case if you're not able to rescue them with a supraglottic airway or other device. So in the third case, it may require that you go in for a surgical airway through the cricothyroid membrane. What about the situation where you can't intubate and you can't ventilate well, but you're sort of ventilating and you wanna bail out. You just wanna wake the patient up and call for help and decide to proceed another day. So here are your options. You can't ventilate very well, but maybe you Ventilation be better if you reposition the head, whether you use airway adjuncts like a nasopharyngeal airway or an oral airway, or a supraglottic airway like a laryngeal mask airway, or my favorite, the eye gel. Another thing is the two-person, two-hand technique that you're all familiar with. The first person does a two-handed jaw thrust, and the second person ventilates. And then if all of this fails, surgical airway may be necessary. Transtracheal jet ventilation is one option, but a cricothyroidotomy is considered to be the more popular option in this day and age based on some studies that have come out of the United Kingdom. One question is how many attempts should we do, uh, do at elective intubation? So if after the second attempt, we're not getting any luck despite repositioning the head and doing cricoid pressure or external laryngeal manipulation or the use of a stylet, then we recommend waking the patient up and try a waking intubation or an alternate plan. The alternate plan might be, for example, the use of regional anesthesia. But for the most part, we want to restrict our attempts of elective intubation to be three attempts. There are a number of techniques available for difficult intubation. Uh, alternative laryngoscope blades are available, such as the Miller blade that can be useful with a big floppy epiglottis, the airway introducer or bougie, which remains quite popular. You slip it under the epiglottis into the trachea. A glide scope or other video laryngoscope like the McGrath is very popular in this setting. And I use that quite a bit, often use it as my first attempt at intubation. Another technique might be fiber optic intubation that I'll be talking about in more detail. This can be done awake, which I'll talk about, or asleep. Um, and uh, sleep, you have limited time before you have to proceed on uh, to ventilate the patient. But in many cases, uh, if you're fast, a sleep fiber optic intubation works well. If you're going for awake intubation, uh, commonly we do it fiber optically, but some people do it with a video laryngoscope, and I'll talk a bit about that in a little while. Retrograde intubation, where we go in through the cricothyroid membrane and pass a wire out through the mouth, is rarely used in the West, but uh, in some places, uh, particularly in some countries with limited access to resources, it is used. I'm thinking India and Pakistan, for example, in rural areas. And then finally, a surgical airway such as a tracheostomy under local anesthesia, which we are sometimes uh, carry out for patients who have, for example, a lot of airway tumor. Now, one thing that you'll want is a difficult airway cart where everything you need is immediately available. So you can... um, so you'll need extra nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal airways, alternate blades like the Miller blades for those still comfortable with using them, endotracheal tubes of assorted sizes uh, and types, particularly narrow endotracheal tubes that can be useful for patients who have a narrowed airway. An airway introducer or gum elastic bougie uh, is an underutilized gem and I highly recommend it. Equipment for fiber optic intubation, equipment for microfarodotomy, exhaled CO2 detector so that, you, uh, uh, so that you know the tube is in the trachea and exhaled CO2 detector. Uh, superglottic airways of various types and sizes of which the IGL is one of the more popular ones and the laryngeal mask airway as well. And then finally, a video, a video laryngoscope of some kind. Uh, I like both the uh, a glide scope as well as the storage unit, as well as that from the graph, but there's many others.
But here's the airway introducer that I am a, a fan of, also called Fuji. And you can see the uh, end with the curve slips under the epiglottis. You can feel the tracheal rings in some cases as you go into the trachea, and then you pass your endotracheal tube over that, and then confirm the position of the tube clinically and by capnography. Now, another thing that you should be familiar with, and I've got the link to an instructional video shown here, is bougie assisted cricothyroidotomies. And uh, this uh, comes from the Difficult Airway Society. You can see that you position the uh, patient in uh, the position shown here. You, you uh, do a, a vertical incision, put in the scalpel, rotate it, put in the gum elastic bougie or airway introducer into it, and then you pass the endotracheal tube over that, and then you check clinically and capnographically. So there are YouTube videos on this that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, and that will uh, complete the details on how this is done. The alternative of transtracheal jet ventilation is not as popular as it once was because of some clinical experience showing that it's a, a technique that frequently fails and bougie assisted crike is considered a more appropriate for this um, setting. If you do run into difficulty with intubation, a difficult airway letter such as this shown here can be useful. You indicate what you did, what problems you encountered. Uh, and this is useful uh, for the next anesthesiologist who may be involved. They may see something like this and simply say, okay, let's do awake intubation because this was difficult in a number of respects, but it may also indicate that they want to do it with a superglottic airway or something else. So the difficult airway letter is good. I would give the patient a couple of copies, one for them to keep and then one for them to give their doctor. So let's move on to talk about awake intubation. There are uh, six steps to this and I'm using the ASA refresher course lecture by Will Rosenblatt, one of the past presidents of the Society for Airway Management, uh, because this, this is his concept of how it's done, and I think it's an excellent approach. Um, so I'm going to go through these step by step, explaining what's going on to the patient, drying up the airway, dilating if you're going through the nose, topicalization of that patient with lidocaine, sedation where needed, and encouraging people to take your time because heart wake intubation cannot be rushed. So here are the stages. First thing you want to do is a clear, confident explanation to the patient, um, and that get his or her cooperation. Explain that they'll feel to remember relatively little because of the drugs used, and that they may want uh, more of anything they just have to ask. So here is what uh, Will Rosenblatt says. My job is to make sure you're breathing during surgery. Your anatomy differs, uh, for example, a little or a lot from normal. I have to make sure I can find your breathing pathway. What I'm going to do is make your throat numb just like the dentist does, except I will not use needles unless I have to. I will then be looking into your mouth in order to find your breathing pathway after I make sure you're comfortable in breathing. and feeling none of this, I'll put the breathing tube in. So that's sort of a layman's explanation. Uh, many people like to desiccate the airway, particularly for nasal intubations, but many others feel that this is an unnecessary step. Uh, but if the patient has copious secretions, it can be helpful. Glycopyrrolate 0.2 to 0.6 milligrams IV is commonly done. Atropine, clonidine, scopolamine also work. But as I said, many experts skip this step uh, as uh, being unnecessary. Sedation, benzodiazepines and opioids are the most popular, they're reversible. Um, diphenhydramine, propofol, dexmedetomidine also work. Propofol being one of the most common, but dexmedetomidine also popular because it doesn't depress respiration. In any event, you'll want to carefully titrate to avoid obstruction of the airway. And intranasal medication is common in children to get their cooperation. The next thing may involve dilatation if you are going through the nasal mucosa. Uh, if a patient has trismus, for example, you have to go in nasally in some cases. In uh, case of nasal intubation, a vasoconstrictor like oxymetazoline or afrin 0.1%, both effective and popular. Cocaine, 4%, uh, still used on occasion, but not nearly as popular um, because uh, of the complexities of dealing with cocaine uh, in a medical legal framework. So oxymetazoline is the thing we usually use for going in nasally. 
Topicalization is the most important step in many respects. Needle blocks are typically not needed. Uh, what I typically use is lidocaine, 2% jelly, 4% viscous, 4% uh, spray. All these are available. Another one is a drug called cetocaine, popular in the United States, a combination of benzopine and tetracaine. Uh, this is not as popular as lidocaine, and lidocaine remains the drug of choice most of the time. Good topical anesthesia for this is essential, and evasive blocks such as uh, super uh, laryngeal blocks typically not needed. Uh, I like to use this device, the magic laryngotracheal atomizer. Uh, another technique is to spray as you go down the biopsy port of your fiber optic scope. Some people put a, a epidural catheter down the biopsy channel of the fiber optic scope and spray under direct vision. So there's a number of ways of doing it. Uh, and the atomizer shown here on the right uh, is one of my most popular techniques for uh, doing the oropharynx. Some people like to do transtracheal blocks. And here it is illustrated. You identify the cricothyroid membrane and you go in through that. Uh, first, you do a skin wheel where you want to go in to topicalize the airway there. Uh, then you'll go in through the cricothyroid membrane using a number 20 angiocaf remove the uh, sharp needle, leaving only the angiocath in place, aspirate to make sure that you are uh, truly in the trachea, and then squirt in two to four cc's of two to 4% lidocaine, and the patient will cough, and that spreads the local anesthetic around. But this block is not essential, but since it's comparable to what's done for retrograde intubation and comparable to what's done when you want to do uh, a surgical airway through the cricothyroid membrane. Some people like to do this to get experience. Another thing is procrastination. Do not hurry to get in the operating. Do what you can in the patient holding area. Take your time and get the patient's confidence. Now, are there some secrets to mastering fiber optic intubation? Well, sometimes secrets come in packages of 10, 10 secrets for success and inner peace and so on. But in some books, Secrets come in packages of 12, the 12 secrets of health and happiness, or the 12 secrets to high self-esteem. Well, let's take a look at this in terms of fiber optic intubation. What are the 12 secrets of fiber optic intubation? Well, number one, preliminaries do count. You must know your equipment, set it up correctly. Know your patient's surgical plan, establish a plan that you're gonna discuss with the patient, you're gonna give oxygen by nasal cannula, you may use a drying agent, you may use sedation, typically midazolam would be used, dexmedetomidine is popular, propofol small amounts is popular. Decide about oral versus nasal, and patients prefer oral well possible, but that may not be possible, for example, in patients with trismus. And decide on awake or asleep. Um, you may want to do a sleep fiber optic intubation in some cases, particularly if you're getting practice, but awake intubation allows you the advantage that you can stop at any time. Reassure to the patient uh, that all is well. Explain the need for awake fiber optic intubation. Don't rush. Agree to stop or pause when the patient gets frustrated. Uh, and remember to provide extra topical anesthesia where needed. The third is pharmacologic sedation that I made reference to. Midazolam, dexmedetomidine, propofol, fentanyl, all are options. Use two suckers, one for the Yankauer sucker, uh, to clean out the mouth and one for the scope. Since the anesthesia machine typically has only one suction port, you'll have to use the surgical suction port for the second one, but having two suckers can be very helpful for maintaining management of secretions. Here is a, another device. This is the AMBU uh, fiber optic intubation device, except that it's not really fiber optic, it has just a television camera on the end. Uh, and this is disposable. This unit can be thrown out after a single use. Uh, and typically in the United States costs two to $300. Another thing to remember is use standing stools unless you are a basketball star. Unless you're really tall, use standing stools. And the reason for this is that you would like the position of the uh, tube to be straight, such as shown on the left here, uh, and not to be curved around, which makes it more difficult to manage. So standing stools make it easier to get that level of control. Another thing I recommend is use the biggest scope available, provides a better image and better suction. 
use a video scope where possible, especially when you may have other individuals who can assist you with the intubation when the airway is complicated by pathology. So you may be doing an awake intubation and the ENT surgeon may be assisting you by commenting on the structures when the airway is totally damaged by tumor, for example. As I've said, good topical anesthesia is essential. Invasive blocks are typically not needed. And here are some of the techniques that I made reference to earlier. Um, as you can see with this device, you can go in through the mouth and squirt into the airway. Sometimes you can do it under direct vision if you're using um, a video laryngoscope, for example the transtracheal block I've made reference to. Here is another reason why uh, understanding the fricothyroid membrane can be important. This is a case of retrograde nasal intubation in a case of subdural hematoma with mandibular fracture. And this patient, they wanted to intubate nasally through the cricothyroid membrane because they wanted to close up the mouth because of a jaw fracture. So this was done with a guide wire as shown here. You could do it fiber optically, of course, but in this particular case, fiber optic intubation was not available as an option because they didn't have the equipment. That shows you what can be done with a little cleverness. Another point is that you want to get the tongue out of the way. And sometimes we just pull the tongue out of the way with a bit of gauze. You can also use it with the uh, suction device, but I recommend the gauze more commonly. And even more commonly, we often use a fiber optic intubation airway, such as the Williams airway shown on the top or the Ovia sapien airway shown on the bottom. The idea here is that when you place this airway in, if they gag on uh, the airway, that means that you need to give more topical anesthesia. If they tolerate the airway uh, nicely, then you can use that airway to uh, spray additional structures under, uh, uh, under uh, uh, direct vision if you want, or uh, you can spray the structures using the sprayer device. Another thing that can be helpful is to use the Parker Flexit endotracheal tube. This particular endotracheal tube has no gap between the tip of the tube and the fiber bundle, and it makes it easier to pass the tube through the glottic structures. Uh, so that is a standard endotracheal tube on the right and the Parker Flexit tube on the left showing no gap uh, between the tip of the Parker tube and the fiber bundle. If there is a gap that gets into trouble, you may have to twist the tube to get it into a more favorable position. Another thing I recommend is fiber optic intubation workshops. And many conferences have workshops uh, that are sponsored where you can go and practice on a mannequin. And that can give you a lot of confidence that you wouldn't have otherwise. In fact, once you've done that, consider also practice fiber optic intubation on easy asleep patients. The idea here is that you've got a patient who's generally healthy uh, and might be getting pretty stuff, uh, knee surgery and uh, standard induction, put in an ovisapien airway or Williams airway, do a jaw thrust and go in fiber optically. But you'll want a backup me intubation method readily available if you run into trouble. Uh, and GlideScope is a common way of doing that. You can also do combined GlideScope fiber optic intubation, which turns out to be a technique that can be very helpful as well. So using a sleep fiber optic intubation in conjunction with a glide scope is another method of securing the airway that can be helpful. What about awake intubation with the glide scope? Well, as an example of how we did it, following sedation with the midazolam, the airway is anesthetized with gargled and atomized corpus and lidocaine, superior laryngeal and transtracheal blocks usually not needed. Once you get a good view of the glottis, administer additional lidocaine using the atomizer I showed you, and that is this device here. Other kinds of atomizers are available as well. Advantages using the GlideScope video laryngoscope for awake intubation. Number one, you get a good view. Method is less uh, affected by secretions or blood compared to fiber optic intubation. Everyone can see the intubation, while this is the case only with video uh, bronchoscopes. The intubation can be recorded. There's no restrictions on the type of endotracheal tube that can be placed, while this is not the case for fiber optic methods because it won't handle small tubes. Sixth, the GlideScope is more rugged than a bronchoscope, it's less susceptible to damage and it's easily cleaned. And finally, while advancing the endotracheal tube into the trachea over a bronchoscope often fails as a result of the tube impinging on the retinoids, this is not the case with the GlideScope video laryngoscope. So this is sometimes why we like to do GlideScope or other uh, video laryngoscope for awake intubation. Here's the GlideScope assisted fiber optic intubation method I, I mentioned. It 
all happened when we started off with a case of a 60 year old woman, history of difficult intubation, previous fiber optic intubation. Now she comes for a reversal of a loop ileostomy and we tried fiber optic intubation orally then nasally without success. They were unable to visualize the cords. The second physician attempt at fiber optic intubation was all also uh, unsuccessful. So uh, I was called in and after administration of more sedation, the glidescope was introduced revealing a very anterior larynx. Under glidescope guidance, fiber optic bronchoscope was redirected 90 degrees anteriorly through the vocal folds for successful intubation. Now I'd like to close by a tribute to one of the founders of the uh, Airway Management and Society for Airway Management, uh, Andy Ovasapien, who started the found, uh, Society for Airway Management in 1995. Uh, and I would recommend this is a society you may want to join uh, should you be interested in airway management issues. The other one is the Difficult Airways Society in the United Kingdom. This was his most difficult case. She was uh, suffering from something that looked like rheumatoid arthritis, her neck broke and fused in this position, and she could only survive by drinking liquids, milkshakes in particular. And Dr. Ovasapien was able to intubate her fiber optically through the nose, despite this position, was able to get her asleep, and then the surgeons were able to reconstruct her uh, spine under general anesthesia. They had considered the possibility of doing it under local anesthesia, but it was clear that she would be getting toxic doses uh, and that risk of convulsions is something they didn't want to deal with. So that's the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, I would like to let people know that if you want a copy of uh, the slides, just let me know uh, and I'd be glad to send them to you. Yeah, I'm at djdoyle at hotmail.com, djdoyle at hotmail.com. And um, I'd like to now open up the floor to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John. And we have uh, first questions here about the difficult airway in laparoscopic surgery and supposed to be this surgery in the pelvis and the patient may need the head down position. Can we use the laryngeal mask airway instead of intubation? Uh, as a rule, uh, if, if, if the patient's going to be head down a lot, intubation is preferred. It's a question of the amount of head down. But in some cases, particularly for prostate surgery, the amount of head down is enormous. And I would certainly want an endotracheal tube for that. Yeah. So is it possible to use it? Oh, it's possible. The question is, it's a higher risk. All right, yeah. And supposed to have your patient expected to be difficult to intubation and you decided to do it under regional anesthesia, okay? And maybe the regional anesthesia is not enough or not working well and again, you have to change to GE. What is the general safety measures you should do to avoid any problem or any sudden airway problem in this situation? Well, if you have a high block, for example, you can lose the airway, but uh, that would be very high epidural or spinal. The other thing you have to worry about are uh, convulsions from toxicity. Uh, number one thing in this setting is uh, when you get into trouble is call for help and get assistance from other people. And you might have to maintain the airway uh, with a superglottic airway if you're unable to intubate, knowing full well that um, this is a suboptimal situation, particularly to have difficulty with ventilation. That being said, uh, there are some people who do laparoscopic surgery, for example, uh, with low filling pressures using superglottic airways, and it's a matter of some controversy, uh, and also work, your, your willingness to work with the surgeons with lower pressures inside the pelvis or, or abdomen. So these are some of the things where the experts will disagree with each other. Yeah. Uh, there is another question about the 
regional anesthesia or local anesthesia you are usually using when you are doing a weak fiber optic intubation? Uh, so if I'm doing a weak fiber optic intubation and I'm doing regional anesthesia to the airway, uh, I will use my, my lidocaine, typically in a dose not exceeding five to seven milligrams per kilogram. Um, a lot of the topical anesthesia that you use is swished around the mouth and then uh, expectorated, thrown out. So the absorption systemically is limited. Yeah. Regarding the patients coming for emergency or semi-emergency surgery, for example, I have patients for hand surgery because of the cut wounds, multiple cut wounds in the hand and the wrist. And the patient already has his last food more than six hours, and the surgery is expected to be two hours. In the, and the, the initial examination of the airway is okay. Can I go ahead with laryngeal mask or should I intubate this patient? If there's no risk of aspiration uh, and it's a limited duration surgery, I think most people would be comfortable with a supraglottic airway um, unless there is some special risk. It's all, it's all about the risk of aspiration in my view. All right. So most of the, and in some cases of emergency, it is not mandatory to intubate all the patients coming for semi-urgent operations. Correct? Uh, if, they, if they have an empty stomach, then yeah. uh, even if it's an emergency, I'm comfortable if it's a full empty, if it's a complete empty stomach. Uh, if there is concern that they haven't met the NPO guidelines, then I would just intubate them with a rapid sequence induction. All right. Uh, if we are going to start the training of new residents, our new trainee, what do you think we should start to train him? This, the routine radioscopy or glidoscope and the CMAC? What do you think? Both together. So my preference is for video laryngoscopy, and my preferences are controversial because I have friends who say the opposite. But yeah. the reason I like to begin with the video laryngoscope is that they get experience with the structures and they see what the structures look like and you can make sure they get a good view. When they move over to direct laryngoscopy, they'll be more familiar with the anatomy by virtue of previous experience with video, uh, uh, video laryngoscopy. The second yes. thing is that um, more and more places are just eliminating direct laryngoscopy uh, and using it only uh, for teaching uh, but not using it in the real world because video laryngoscopy is becoming so much more common everywhere around the world. All right. Yeah. I ask these questions because I saw many studies. The first pass success, especially in ER emergency department in the beginner, when they are using the glidoscope or CMAC, it is usually more successful than the ordinary laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy. So that's why I ask it when you, usually you are started training with the routine uh, intubation. Anyway, we have emergency cesarean section and the patient is difficult intubation. What is the outlines of general management of this patient? Okay. Cesarean so, section with difficult airway. Yeah, so number one, uh, you wanna call for help. Make sure there's extra people around. Uh, number two, this is a case where if, if it is an emergency cesarean section, you've got to move right, uh, right ahead. You may not have the opportunity to wake up the patient and try fiber optically. That may not be an option for you when you have fetal bradycardia. So in that case, most people I know would put in a supraglottic airway and maintain the airway that way until the baby's out. Uh, and then figure out what to do next with the extra help in the room. In a number of cases, people have done elective cesarean sections under um, uh, the use of classic LMA classics. And there was a whole series published out of Korea in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, a whole series of uh, uh, elective cesarean sections using a supraglottic airway without uh, complications. Uh, so the risk of aspiration is there, but it is relatively small. Uh, 
So this is a matter of some controversy. It will also depend on where you practice. Uh, for example, that article was published in a Canadian journal, but uh, the American journals may not have been as happy with it, given that they traditionally teach about the risk of aspiration in the setting of cesarean sections. All right, okay. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Yasser. Yasser, you want to ask the director or you would write your question? I, because I think writing, you told me not uh, okay. um, well, helping me. Just thank you, Dr. Yasser. I, I have two questions because now we are in era of COVID and we see many patients with the tracheal stenosis for critical level and I engaged in one of the case and the case I listed, we can't put a tube and the other airways, okay. Do we have an, any guideline or algorithm for this, uh, those patients, especially in this, uh, the number increasing? This is the first question. So I, I think you made reference to tracheal stenosis. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a patient with tracheal stenosis, it's common that you're going to be doing a lot of procedures such as tracheal dilation, uh, mm -hmm. or even in some cases, a tracheal reconstruction. In this case, the airway management plan has to be uh, established in conjunction with the surgical team because it's really a shared airway and uh, there's a variety of ways of doing it. Uh, jet ventilation is one possibility, the use of uh, the high flow oxygen, another possibility, the use of a microlaryngeal tube is sometimes done, the use of the Hunsinger catheter with, with high speed jet ventilation is sometimes done. Depends on the equipment that's available and the preferences of the surgeon. But tracheal stenosis is uh, something that requires special consideration uh, and above all cooperation with the surgical team. And you had a second question to match that? So a question, uh, do you think that in the near future, because is there a uh, revolution of everything of technology and artificial intelligence? So do you think in the near future, the ultrasound or artificial intelligence will have a role in um, difficult intubation or still not? Um... Uh, so that is a question I can't answer, but I can tell you there's two schools of thought because uh, I've asked people about this. Uh, one school of thought is that artificial intelligence is going to uh, be helpful. If you have a CT scan, for example, uh, of the head, you might be able to use that in conjunction with a special fiber optic bronchoscope with position sensors. Uh, and so you can intubate using the CT scan as an additional guide, just like they do with some endoscopic surgery procedures. So there are people working on this particular approach and that's as high tech as it gets. And there's other people who simply say, listen, uh, I'm really good at fiber optic intubation. Uh, it's a skill, you just have to do a lot of it. And all this extra stuff is probably of limited value, but we don't know how that's going to play out until the technology is invented. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Doyle. Thank you, Dr. Yasser for um, um, okay. uh, the answer. Thank one, you. For one more answer. question for Dr. John Doyle regarding, do you have any case of retrograde intubation by yourself before? Uh, no, I've never done one, and I've never seen one except for YouTube. When I uh, uh, had a patient who was getting a laryngectomy and I wanted to do that, and I talked to the surgeon. The surgeon was horrified. Uh, he made it clear yeah. that uh, he wanted nothing to do with this because, after all, I was good at fiber optic intubation, wasn't I? All right. Do yeah. you need at some stage to do a surgical airway cricothyroidotomy or something like that, needle or surgical cricothyroidotomy? you need to do that in some cases? Uh, no, uh, I have never had to do um, a surgical airway. Uh, and a part of it, I hope, is because we spend a lot of time evaluating it and don't get into trouble. But when uh, surgical airway is needed right up front, uh, for example, a stride or a patient in the operating room, that's typically done by a surgeon. <laughs> the All surgical right. decision will be is it going to be a tracheostomy so the second or third tracheal rings? If there's time, if there's not time, they may go directly through the cricothyroid membrane and then reconstruct from there. Yeah, yeah. I think you have more than 40 years experience in airway management. So I have two questions. What is the most difficult case in your practice since you started as easy? You can't forget it. Oh, well, the case that I'll never, ever forget was... Uh, I had just 
ended my training when I was a junior. And I had a patient who had an infected submandibular space. And I started to intubate her awake, but everywhere we went, we had, yeah. we had pink, even though we dried her and did all the right things. It was pink everywhere. So I called in a senior colleague because you're supposed to call for help. And oh, a senior colleague yeah. had all the same problems. She couldn't intubate, couldn't, couldn't see the structures. Everything was so edematous. Uh, and he was one of my seniors throughout. I had a lot of respect for his talent. Um, yeah. So he took a look at her from the side and then gave her pedophile and succinylcholine and gave me the laryngoscope. And she decided that she could be intubated. But of course, when I put in the video, when I put in the uh, direct laryngoscope, there was nothing that was identifiable. I passed control back to him. He put in the laryngoscope and nothing was uh, identifiable. And in the end, the saturation went all the way down. We had just got pulse oximeters around that time. The saturation went down into the 20s and bradycardia had already set in when I was giving atropine to restore the heart rhythm. Uh, that's how low the saturation was. And then finally he got the tube in at the price of two teeth. Uh, but the patient was rescued and all was well. And the teeth it turned out wasn't a problem either because the guy doing the surgery was a maxillofacial surgeon and he put the teeth back in again. Uh, oh. So we have a saying, no harm, no foul. But uh, it was clear to me that there was a lot of lessons there. And uh, one of the lessons is that just because a person is more senior than me doesn't mean that their judgment is that much better. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll remember that case forever. Yeah. And uh, do you have in your experience any patient he developed the cardiac arrest during intubation from severe hypoxemia? Or you didn't have a case like that? No, I haven't. Uh, no, I haven't had a case like that. All right, yeah. You mentioned also you can use two equipment in the same time, like fiber optic and the glidoscope. This is not a little bit too bulky and there's no space in the mouse to do that. Well, it, it turns out it's not that hard to do. Yeah, uh, can, but you need two people. Fiber optic, light the scope at the same time. Yeah, so but you need two people. So you will uh, you, you will use put your glide scope into position, and then have your assistant hold it there. Oh yeah, and you yeah. Do your fiber optic intubation uh, through the mouth, and what happens is that because the whole airway is opened up with your glide scope, it's a pretty oh. straightforward view. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You don't need it. Uh, uh, I think now we came to the end of the meeting. I will leave Dr. Safa to tell her comment before finishing. Any comment, uh, Dr. Safa? Dr. Safa, are you around? One, one moment to see. Do you have any questions? Any more questions for Dr. Jo Dr. Safa? Yeah. The Dr. Wissam, you, you still have a question, Dr. Wissam? What is the question? Wissam. What are the questions? No, I, I, suppose yeah, I, that have, I have a couple of questions, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Dr. Doyle. Uh, what about uh, examination of the nose before doing the awake intubation? Is it wise to choose the, the wide nostril before starting? Yes, so if you have to go in nasally, then what I'll do is get the patient to breathe in through the right nostril, then the left nostril, ask them which one is better. Yeah. And I'll make a little dot on the, on the side with a pen. Uh, so I'll remember that side and I'll intubate through that nostril. But also I'll be using oxymetazoline uh, both before yeah. induction of anesthesia uh, and uh, after if I'm doing nasal intubation uh, by any means. So, so, uh, so you are. We are asking the patient what, which nostril is, is is wide, or we we can examine this by by passing uh, nasopharyngeal uh, airway or something like that. Well, you could, but it's easier just to put your finger on 
one nostril and have to breathe in through the opposite and then mm. switch sides. So block off the left, have to breathe through the right, then block off the right, have to breathe through the left and just ask them. And the patient will tell yep. you if one's better than the other. Yeah, okay. Uh, another question, please. Uh, wh what about the, the worst scenario ever? Cannot ventilate, cannot intubate uh, with difficult or very difficult surgical airway. What can we do with that situation? Uh, well, if you can't intubate, can't ventilate, number one, call for help. Number two, establish a surgical airway. Uh, and if we have a very difficult surgical airway also, by the way. Uh, well, sometimes if, it, if it's too messy, people die. Uh, and an example mm -hmm. of that that we had was a patient who had tumor everywhere, uh, tumor everywhere in the larynx and in the trachea, but refused the tracheostomy. Uh, it wasn't the right decision, but it was the patient's decision. He kept refusing tracheostomy. By the time that he came to the operating room in an emergency for uh, complete respiratory distress, when they tried to do a uh, surgical airway, both the cricothyroid membrane and the tracheal rings uh, were fully filled with tumor. And the only thing mm. that ever would have rescued him would be extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which was not an option in a terminally ill patient. Okay, okay. The last question, one more question. Uh, uh, in, the, in, in patient with awakened to your patient, do you, did you refer to, to start uh, giving the general anesthesia after complete intubating the patient, after the, the, the tube is in endotracheal already, or just uh, w once you have the, the, uh, the bronchoscope inside the trachea, you start to give the general anesthesia? No, the tube has to be in place and the carbon dioxide has to come out of the tube. Uh, the procedure of passing the tube on the fiber optic bronchoscope into the trachea, it's not perfect. Sometimes you'll end up with an obstruction and you don't know what's going on and you have to regroup. So it's only yeah, yeah. when the fiber optic bronchoscope is out of the endotracheal tube, the endotracheal tube cuff is inflated and the CO2 is detected or you have the right squeeze on uh, the rebreathing bag, you give the propofol to have them go off to sleep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lastly, many thanks, Prof. Dr. John Doyle. Many thanks for you for this uh, high opportunity to meet you in this highly uh, uh, and amazing scientific presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Many thanks for you and for your attendance and your time and your effort. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'll see you next meeting. Bye. Okay. And I look forward to future invitations. And if anybody needs a copy, uh, just send me an email and I'll send you a copy of the slide set. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I enjoyed Thank the time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you.